Hi, everyone, and welcome to the GW Sustainable Urban Planning Programs uh, Salon Series. This is the second in our series of in inviting urban planning thought leaders to the table to discuss their work and, and their research. And this is a uh, function of the Sustainable Urban Planning Program at GW, which is a 48 hour credit uh, urban planning master's degree that's fully accredited by the Planning Accreditation Board. It's, I'm Sandra Whitehead and I am the program director as well as a uh, associate professor here. So, thank you everyone for joining this evening. It's our pleasure to welcome Dr. Ana Batista, who um, I've been following her work for quite some time, and she's been working in this space of, of using, ur ur using urban planning tools to um, promote environmental justice. And I will let Anna um, introduce herself a little bit more deeply and uh, begin her presentation. Welcome, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. And uh, hello, everyone. I can't see you all, but I trust that you're all on and um, can see me. I'm going to share my screen so that you can follow along with the presentation that I prepared here. Um, on this, can you all see that? Yeah. Yes. Uh, great. Um, so, yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm, um, I'm Anna and. I am an associate professor at the New School in the Environmental P Policy and Sustainability Management graduate program here in New York City, but I also um, help run a center uh, called the Tishman Environment and Design Center at the New School where we do a lot of co-produced research with environmental justice and climate justice groups around the country. Um, and some of what I'll present today is an example of some of that co-produced research that we worked on with folks um, in Chicago. Um, so, and you know, most of my work, I was, I'm trained as an urban planner in the sense that I got a PhD <laughs> in urban planning, but really um, have been doing mostly environmental justice work first in my own community. I worked as an environmental justice um, uh, organizer in, in Newark, New Jersey, which is my hometown. That's the image that you see on the opening slide there um, of my community. And um, after getting my doctorate, I spent a decade working in the neighborhood doing really uh, hands-on work in the neighborhood on environmental justice, uh, community-based planning and advocacy work, um, and learned really a lot of what I know about planning and zoning from those decades of work in my own neighborhood. Even though I learned the theory of planning, the practice of it on the ground is, is uh, informative <laughs> and uh, very instructional. So I, I learned quite a bit from um, those efforts and have continued to work very closely with um, organizers and organizations on the ground in Newark um, and throughout New Jersey and the, and the US on many of these same issues. Um, so, a little bit about um, zoning and environmental justice and land use um, seems like it's quite a hot topic these days. You know, um, zoning and land use when I was in graduate school was not the sexiest of topics, that's for sure. <laughs> and, um, and certainly probably very uh, at the time that I was in grad school, you know, the connections between environmental justice um, and local land use weren't as much of a focus really, uh, certainly not for planners, state, state and, and government planners um, as it is today. Um, and I think today there's a, a, a much greater awareness of the connections, the deep historical ties um, that land use and zoning have had on the conditions that today we call environmental injustice or environmental racism. And uh, the conditions that we see are not happenstance. They are the product of many um, political, institutional, uh, you know, historic processes that have been sedimented over time. And if you're a student of planning and zoning, you know, you know well that there are many interconnected threads here. Um, and there is a growing interest in trying to look at state and local policies for addressing environmental injustice because so much 
of what we, uh, the mess we are in, in terms of environmental injustice. Uh, we got here through land use and zoning, and I'm a firm believer that um, it should be a tool to help us get out of it, right? It's not the only way, it certainly is not the only way uh, that we will need to address environmental injustice, but it should be one of the ways um, that we address it. Um, and so there has been a, a, quite a bit of an uptick of interest in both passing state and local laws and ordinances um, that address environmental injustice um, very specifically, uh, which is an interesting trend. And I have some articles here. Um, since I did my research even, there's been quite a, uh, a surge in interest from cities in particular, like Minneapolis, Chicago, uh, and many others that have taken up this issue at the local level, not even at the state level. Um, and uh, again, just the connections between uh, environmental racism and land use. Um, many of you probably already know this and know it well, uh, but there's a large body of empirical evidence that point to uh, the coincidence of, um, you know, the location of people of color, black and brown, indigenous communities, low wealth communities, and high incidences of environmental burden, pollution exposure, health, uh, detrimental health outcomes. Um, and many of these things tie back to um, things like historical processes like redlining that occurred that uh, restricted the mobility of black and, and other people of color in residential areas, the de development of highway systems through um, neighborhoods, black neighborhoods, urban renewal processes that destroyed the fabric of many neighborhoods. Um, and, you know, all of these historical processes, along with uh, environmental you know, regulations and permitting that allow the concentration of noxious industries, um, have combined um, to the effect of what we see today, right, which is that uh, very much today there is this continuing pattern of disproportionate burdens and health impacts in communities of color, uh, and particularly black communities. Um, so um, if we look at the history of zoning, this shouldn't come as a surprise, really, because um, what we know of zoning's history, uh, relatively recent history, you know, the last 100 years or so or more, um, there was uh, a long period of time where racial zoning, which is explicitly discriminatory forms of zoning that restricted the mobility of black people and other people of color out of uh, particular neighborhoods, residential neighborhoods, was the law in many, many, uh, many cities. Uh, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., uh, New York, and you know, you name it, most cities had these restrictive racial zoning covenants. And even as racial zoning was explicit racial zoning was outlawed by the courts, um, communities, zoning and planning officials, urban planning in general as a profession, endorsed these uh, racial zoning practices uh, by caveat and used de jour forms of zoning like exclusionary zoning uh, and basically um, class-based zoning uh, to discourage and discriminate against people of color, right? Um, and this led to patterns of settlement and residential and industrial settlement um, that continued to harden racial segregation. And in addition to that, we had environmental regulations that were, came into effect later in the 1970s and 80s that were race neutral. And they had the effect of really um, further entrenching the pattern of industrial concentration of noxious uses in areas that were exclusively zoned industrial, and those areas tended to be the areas that had been um, uh, formed by racial zoning and redlining and other practices. So all of these things, all of these supposed race neutral policies really had the effect of hardening um, this uh, of segregation of land uses and of people. And uh, just one more thing about zoning. <laughs> is, of course, you all probably know this already, um, but uh, zoning is one of the most powerful tools that local municipalities and counties have at their disposal. They control the accumulation and uh, real estate development processes, right? They are very powerful tools. 
And as such, they are delegated to municipalities and counties um, through the police powers granted to states. So states have this power and they delegate it um, through their constitutions to, to, to localities. Now, um, each state does it slightly differently and allows different powers of delegation. So zoning and land use is not the same everywhere. Um, and certainly the organization of sub-state uh, entities is very different. You know, you have the West Coast where you have a lot of unincorporated land and then you have the East Coast where very, very few, uh, if any, a land is unincorporated. <laughs> and so um, the power of municipalities to pass laws or ordinances differs greatly across the country. Um, and you have places like Texas that severely restrict and sometimes completely forego land use and zoning um, to states like California that require environmental justice be part of master plans in cities. So you, you have a whole continuum um, across the country. And I'll just mention that, you know, um, one of the things that does give me hope about the use of land use and zoning as a tool is that there are affirmative ways, you know, because zoning is such a powerful tool, you know, uh, the real estate developers, they've figured out how to use it to their benefit. And we, um, planners and, and scholars and community organizations have to also learn and try to wrestle the power of zoning and land use for the benefit of our communities and not just for the exclusive benefit of industries and uh, developers. And there are ways to intervene using the land use and zoning process. And these are just some <laughs> of the ways that you can do it. You know, you can you know, use land use for all kinds of things like doing impact analysis, strengthening codes, um, creating overlay zones, restricting or tightening controls over land uses to be more protective. Uh, you know, augmenting public um, uh, participation and outreach. Um, so there are a whole host of tools at our disposal and we have to be creative. <laughs> this is a real a call uh, for folks to be creative in thinking about how to use land use and zoning outside the box um, that sometimes we're taught. Um, so a little bit about the research that we did back in 20, I think this is, gosh, this is 2018, maybe 2019. Um, we got a call, I, I got a call from friends uh, in Chicago. I had worked for uh, several years, many years with colleagues in Newark, New Jersey to try to pass a local ordinance on environmental justice and cumulative impacts. And it took us seven years to pass that local law in New Newark. Um, and it was really groundbreaking for us. It wasn't everything we had wanted, but it was, uh, a big effort on our part. And we had friends in Little Village Environmental Justice Organization, which is an EJ organization in Chicago, who similarly were wrestling with um, threats of rezoning in their neighborhoods, the movement of industrial noxious uses like general iron from white neighborhoods, you know, communities that were turning, were gentrifying like Lincoln Park into black and brown communities. Um, and when they went and complained to the city council and they were fighting at the uh, local land use boards, the planners would tell them, well, there's, we can't do anything about EJ. There's nothing we can do that's outside of our purview. That's the purview of the state and the EPA. We don't get involved in those issues. We just zone according to the land use. And so they came to me and said, hey, how did you do that work in Newark and can you help us show and prove to the planners in the city that there are ways to address environmental justice. Um, and I said, sure, there's lots of ways because you know we knew that when we were doing this work in Newark, we worked with folks in California and other places that had been trying to push local laws. Um, and so we undertook this co-produced research. We did it with six organizations in Chicago, EJ organizations really in consultation with them and NRDC out of Chicago to try to do sort of a snapshot assessment of like across the country, where are some interesting um, approaches to addressing, explicitly addressing environmental justice in land use policy or zoning policy? Um, and so that's what we did. We didn't set out to be comprehensive, um, in no way try to capture everything, but try to at least get a snapshot in time of what's possible, just to, you know, so that, you know, sort of proof of concept. And 
Um, we did this work and, and that, again, I was informed by a lot of the work that we did in Newark um, over many, many years and we're still fighting rezoning. There's a rezoning proposal right now in the city of Newark that residents are fighting, uh, which is um, down zoning and up zoning EJ communities. Uh, but what we found when we looked across the country was that um, most of the laws that we found that were passed as ordinances explicitly focused on environmental justice had strong environmental justice advocacy behind it and organizing. And so, you know, community cities weren't just on their own being like, you know, it would be great as if we had an EJ law. No, it was really the product of a lot of organizing and intense and often prolonged efforts by local advocates uh, who had been fighting uh, lots of different zoning and land use applications over time and finally got tired of that and really tried to push for reform. Um, and so we saw really strong leadership from the bottom up. And then uh, in many cases, right political opportunities, you know, uh, there was a change in mayor or there was a, a, an opportunity to get city councilors on their side and residents really pushed for a local accountability. And those local political contexts allowed for policy changes that maybe at the state level might prove more difficult um, to win. Um, whereas at the local level residents had more of an opportunity to more directly engage with local policymakers and planners to push uh, an agenda forward. Um, so uh, we also saw that many organizations, environmental justice organizations were working with their own planners or with planners who were sympathetic to environmental justice and understood environmental justice both within uh, local government and outside of local government and others pro bono or advocacy planners um, who were helping to do this work alongside and with EJ organizations. Um, and then, of course, we looked at laws and it won't be any surprise when you see the map. <laughs> Many of the laws and policies were in states where there were what I would call favorable political conditions and enabling laws that allowed local municipalities to enact their own protective EJ laws. So you don't see a huge amount of EJ laws in the South, in the Gulf South, you know, other than Fulton County, Georgia. Austin, Texas tried to pass a ban that was rescinded because the state of Texas then banned moratoriums. Um, they banned bans. Um, <laughs> so you see that there's a pattern there of East Coast and West Coast, um, you know, some Midwest um, uh, states with cities that pass ordinances. So um, it follows this trend that we talked about earlier. Uh, but we found, you know, 40 different policies, 23 different cities, counties, and really interestingly, utilities, public utilities. So the Water Commission in San Francisco, um, you know, these are, we don't often think about uh, local utilities as stakeholders in land use, but uh, many times they're, they are large landholders and control large pieces of land and have um, some authority um, to regulate and oversee land uses uh, under their purview as well. Um, and some of them, like highlights from that study were, um, you know, sort of how these typologies of the types of policies that cities um, and counties proposed. Um, some of them were bans, you know, sort of outright prohibitions on the types of noxious facilities that communities wanted to avoid, or they felt like we have too many of, too much of this, we don't want any more. Many times those are facilities tied to fossil fuel infrastructures, uh, but not exclusively. Um, then you had general EJ policies, you know, uh, you know, communities like Fulton County, Georgia, um, and others had, you know, sort of broad sweeping commitments to environmental justice and environmental justice programs and strategic goals that they set out across multiple agencies. Um, many um, cities, and I see this is an increasing trend that is like the favorite kind of type of policy, which is environmental review processes. And these are um, processes that try to mimic almost the state environmental permitting processes where new developments and industries have to undergo some kind of a review process, either to ascertain cumulative impacts or burdens on environmental justice communities before they're allowed to move forward in the development process. And so this ties land uses to development um, decisions in the cities. Um, and this is done through a variety of ways. Um, 
And there's like proactive planning. I'd say the most best example of that is sort of the green zones model, which came out of California and the Los Angeles and commerce um, communities that really pushed for trying to get specific designations that were proactive in the sense that they both protected, laid um, certain protections in those zones for those communities, but in addition also targeted investments and talked about, you know, how, what do we, how do we attract the types of development we want and not just stop the developments uh, that we don't want. And then uh, you had a few communities that had um, targeted land use measures. I think, it, you know, it's harder to get at, it's most of these policies were, are targeted at new proposals or new developments or future developments. Um, and there are some cases where communities are looking at existing, what do we do about existing concentrations and grandfathered uses in our communities? Uh, so there were some creative approaches like amortization laws that tried to phase out non-conforming uses. And then finally, like the one we probably could have spent a lot more time on, but we didn't have the time and resources to do, which is the, uh, the use of public health codes and enforcement powers of localities. You know, how do you use your health officers or enforcement code code enforcers um, to in, you know try to make improvements in, in um, the conditions in land uses. Um, so that was another type of typology of policies we found. I'm going to stop here and I'll just mention a few resources. You can read more about the the report both on our website. Um, and we also have a tool on our website on cumulative impacts where you could look at um, state policies on cumulative impacts. We have a few of the city policies there as well, you know, New York City's policies and a few others. Um, and there's also um, a state by state um, website that you can check out. It has some city policies listed as well as state policies, but um, this uh, environmental justice state by state was an effort of uh, the University of Vermont Law School, Environmental Justice Clinic, and several universities working together to try to put together a 50 state survey um, again. So you can check those policies out as well. But yeah, I'll stop here so that there's time for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Batista. That was really really interesting and, and deep for such a short period of time. Um, I'm going to open it up for uh, questions to the group. Well, if you guys don't have one, I have one. Could you talk a little bit about how the amortization of a uh, model works to phase out unwanted land uses? Are they paying the, the companies to relocate or are um, they just giving them a certain amount of time to move? How does that work? The one that the example of that, that's probably best known is uh, in national city, California, which is done in the San Diego area and uh, Southern California. Um, and they had a big problem with lots of um, uh, auto body shops and scrap metal yards interspersed with residential neighborhoods. So they were living really with a really, really close, densely populated areas with residences on both sides. And, um, you know, as, you know, the area became more residential, those non-conforming uses were creating a lot of issues for neighborhood residents, you know, um, noise and dust and, and just noxious fumes for the workers and for the folks there. So the amortization law that they passed, the residents really fought hard for it, um, was uh, it, it basically gave the, those businesses, and they had specific types of businesses that they, non-conforming uses that they targeted. So it wasn't everything, um, but they sort of had a list of a particularly noxious or impactful um, types of businesses and they gave them a certain amount of time to come into compliance and to leave, basically. Um, I think it was something like seven years. They had three to seven years to move out of the, those locations uh, before they would start getting fined. Um, 
and they restricted their ability to like expand or do anything like that. And then they did give them an option of like pure sites that you could potentially move into, but it wasn't like those sites were purchased for them or, you know, it would still be the, um, the onus would still be on the business to leave um, and to find those sites, those, those alternative um, sites. You know, when I, when I checked back in, you know, I know a little bit about that case because some of the EJ organizations there reported that it wasn't as successful as they had hoped because the city really wasn't willing to take the facilities to court to, re, you know, require them to move when they refused to move. <laughs> um, you know, and, and part of what's, you know, my, this landscape assessment didn't look at implementation. It just looked at like what's possible. Um, but it would be a whole other study to go back and talk to groups on the ground and be like, okay, well, what worked, what didn't work? Um, because it seemed like a great idea, but at the end of the day, if the city isn't willing to go to bat and really enforce that law and see it to its conclusion, um, I think they only moved a few, like a handful of businesses, six or seven businesses, and they tried to tighten the zoning to make it harder for any new ones to open up there, but they didn't really successfully phase out um, many of those noxious uses. Um, so, you know, those are the things that a lot of lessons learned. If you looked at any one of these policies, there's probably a lot of lessons in terms of what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, that was the one that struck me as, oh, I hadn't really heard of that one before, right? And then I wondered, and you answered this question, right, if they got sued. <laughs> but it sounds like the opposite happened was they just didn't, right, the city didn't sue them for compliance. Exactly. Like, in other words, you know, and this is true probably, like, in the city of Newark, we also had, a, you know, trouble getting the city to implement its own laws. Many cities have amazing laws on the books. <laughs> But then when it comes to implementation, um, if it's not codified and institutionalized and then challenged, you know, this, if cities are not committed to following through through the implementation phase, it becomes very difficult to see the product of those ordinances come to fruition. So, you know, when you talk to EJ advocates, the ones that have been most successful, it's, you know, you have to have a sustained and prolonged attention, not only to the passage of the bill, but then to the enforcement and implementation of the ordinance. Um, and sometimes the implementation is even more important because if you don't have, if the city doesn't have resources, if they don't have well-trained boards or planners, they don't have capacity, um, you know, it just, they won't follow through and the policies won't get um, implemented. And then in some cases, I know communities like Chicago ended up suing, <laughs> they ended up pulling in HUD and EPA and other entities to try to hold the city accountable. Um, and that's often what's required is sort of a multi-pronged approach to try to hold cities accountable. And that's why I was so excited that, you know, zoning could be, a, you know, a tool for promoting environmental yeah. justice, because to me, zoning is the most entrenched thing that local governments do, right? Like if they have all of this power to, in broad latitude to use this power. And and I was just like, well, almost every city has zoning, right? They could all do it. But as you point out, right, there has to be capacity, there has to be will, and there has to be follow through. Yeah, the will part is very important. Um, as many, if many of you know, if you've been to the zoning board hearings and the land use board hearings, <laughs> The political wills and the composition of your local planning and, and, and city zoning boards makes a huge difference. And who are they accountable to ultimately? What are they? What kinds of pressures do they respond to? Uh, remember that you know planners only do so much. You know they might have proposed zoning and planning, but the boards, which are often appointed by mayors <laughs> or city council people, depending on your city have a tremendous amount of power. And those folks are not, they're volunteers. They're not professional, in many cases, in most cases, they're not professional planners. Um, and so, you know, how these decisions get made, you know, it, it really requires a lot of organizing um, by groups on the ground. I've been hogging the conversation. I wanna make sure that other folks can can jump in. Um, go ahead and unmute yourself, Susan. You can um, ask your question. 
Hey, Anna, we haven't seen each other in a very long time uh, since we worked together when I was in Newark at Rutgers. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about efforts to um, engage communities in those zoning board proceedings. I mean, you know, as, as I'm sure most of you know, many of those hearings happen at a time that's very difficult for people with families or working families to get to. Um, there, you, you know, could have to sit there for three hours waiting to speak for two minutes. And there's some very often very um, what the board and adversaries try to make sound very technical and intimidating. I'm wondering if you could talk at all about community education or outreach efforts that have been successful um, to enable more people to engage at the zoning decision making level. Yeah, um, you know, the the. Some of the best organizing I've seen has come from local groups like the one I used to work for, Ironbound Community Corporation in Newark and Little Village in Chicago and East Yards for Environmental Justice in California. These are groups that, environmental justice grassroots groups that understand land use and zoning sites. They understand them um, and they've been in the trenches bringing people by the busload to their local land use boards. And how do you get people to do that, right? Like it's just super boring. You know, it is not easy work. That's work that's built up over lots of time, organizing residents, not just on one issue, but on many issues. Um, and when, you know, those organizations call forward residents and members to come out to hearings, um, there's been a lot of political education behind that, right? So to understand how this fits into the bigger picture. Um, there have been great, you know, zoning and land use uh, 101s, like, you know, in the city of Newark, um, there were a lot of efforts to go ward by ward to do zoning 101 pop-ups, you know, they would, you know, pull out like Legos and show people the basics of zoning, um, understanding even more importantly, the politics of zoning, who makes the decisions and at what point can the public intervene? Those are the most important pieces of information that um, people come armed with um, and understanding the bigger picture, right? Like how does this one decision fit into the bigger picture? So yeah, there's been a lot of great um, public education, popular education tools. I know um, I worked with some great folks at the Center for Urban Pedagogy that um, helped, you know, create all these local tools in New York City uh, for popular education on, on planning and zoning. Um, but, you know, how you get people to meetings, that's like organizing 101. <laughs> you know, like, it's amazing to me, like, people come out and honestly, since COVID, a lot of local planning and zoning boards have gone online, and that has been great. Because now all of a sudden you don't have to bus people <laughs> to the city hall, and you know really you got to have diehard people ready to go and sit for hours. Now with online meetings being so much more accessible to people, we can get a hundred, two hundred people, three hundred people sometimes for these local land use boards, and and the city council, you know, the 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 members, the commission members have to listen. So I would say one of the biggest lessons I've learned is if you open it up and make it accessible, people will show up to those meetings. Um, so in, in the online context has actually been very good for that, at least from what I've seen in my local context. Thanks for that. Uh, Michael, you wanna unmute and ask your question? Go ahead, Michael. We can't hear you if you're talking. So it seems like the microphone is on, but we can't hear what you're saying. Yeah. Why don't you type it into the chat? While Michael is typing his question into the chat, um, why don't we move to the next uh, 
question. Is there another question? I thought I saw another hand. Oh, Eva, go ahead. Hi, Anna. Um, I don't know. We have passed each other in many uh, arenas there in New York City. In particular, I've done a lot of work with uh, the New York Environmental Justice Alliance and most of their members. Uh, I have a question specifically about the green zones in California and how many or any have they actually been able to develop and implement overlays, land use and zoning overlays mm -hmm. um, in, um, in um, I understand the, the organizing and the comprehensive plans or the, the policy plans, but are there some examples where um, they've actually gotten green overlays? Zoning overlays. Yeah. Uh, yes, they did. They have um, the the biggest examples: LA City and LA County, and mm -hmm. Commerce. Mm -hmm. Those three are very popular because they were the first, um, and they were called clean up green up zones. Um, and they were in three pilot neighborhoods in LA City. Um, LA County was doing it for the whole, you know, whole county. They weren't piloting it like, like LA. Um, and the California Environmental Justice Alliance, CJA, just put out a report, maybe it was six months ago or, you know, uh, a while ago, I just saw it, that has 18 case studies of green zones in California that you can okay. read up, read about. I can put the... I think I might have the link here somewhere. So I'll, I'll just put the link in the chat so you can check it out and see where they've gone since the initial proposal, which was really a pilot that LA mm -hmm. and Commerce mm -hmm. tried, and then it kind of spread. And then each, each community that's tried it has done something slightly different. And they've used, some of them have used overlay zones. Some of them have gone just like the total, um, like visioning and planning and trying to attract certain types of investments. Um, Minneapolis tried the green zones approach, but, you know, to varying effects, I think the Minneapolis EJ communities were not happy with the results of the green zones, um, you know, because they're also dealing with the pressures of gentrification, you know, so like there, there's always this like push and pull around who's laying the groundwork and the framing of what's good or bad in terms of zoning in an area. You know, like one person's making something greener, it could be another person's like, oh, you're just gentrifying our neighborhood. Um, and so really there has to be a lot of local input into what those green zones look like and what, what you want. What, what does the community actually want to attract? Um, and that's why the, I think the Minneapolis one was a, like a mixed bag. So a lot of EJ groups felt like that was proposed from people outside saying what should be in those neighborhoods as opposed mm -hmm. to people in those neighborhoods saying what they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'll, I'll put the, um, I'll put the uh, CJA report here so you can look, read up more on the green zones there. Thank you. Not seeing other hands. So I want to make sure that um, if you have a question, get your hand up. All right, going once, twice. All right, it looks like. Thank you for putting that in the in the chat, Anna. It looks like um, our our listeners do not have more questions. I want to thank you so much for coming this evening, and for for sharing your your work with us. And my last question is, will there be a follow on to the landscape paper? <laughs> I know people ask me that. Um, so I would love to do a follow up, especially on implementation, you know, like what worked, what didn't work. Um, you know, I think if there was a good partner, I, I, I prefer to do it with EJ partners who are interested in doing that work. Um, so, you know, I think if there's an interest from EJ groups to do that follow up. We, we would we would take it on. It, it would be a big inter, other, uh, undertaking um, because implementation is always messier than uh, <laughs> than just passing the law. But but yeah, maybe the question, the answer is maybe if there's a group out there who wants to partner with us and um, co-produce that. 
Well, thank you so much. Um, and if any of you are in an EJ community and, and work for an organization that wants to partner with Dr. Batista on that, give her a call. We have recorded this presentation and I will be sharing the recording um, through our YouTube channel back out to all of the attendees. So it'll be just a couple of days. But thank you all so much for coming and thanks again, Anna, for joining us. My pleasure. Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody. <laughs>